Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to Lynette pre-release analysis. I don't know how to feel about Lynette yet. I think it's hard to give a proper assessment of her kit because I get the impression that a decent amount of her quote-unquote power is going to be in the fact that she, at least on release, is going to be the only character who has the affiliation or the alignment for the new fault and mechanic the new fault and mechanics that is uja but that's uh, we'll talk about this all in a little bit uh let's just start with the same stuff as usual so somewhat high base hp actually fairly high for uh for a four star fairly high base defense kind of whatever base attack animal damage ascension nothing all that crazy here so let's get into what she does she's a sword user animal sword user nothing all that interesting on her normal attacks her elemental skill is kind of basically the animal equivalent of yelan's E, but without pulling the enemies inwards. I basically, you activate it, you zoom into the enemies, and then when you release, you deal damage to them. The damage itself doesn't necessarily hit every enemy. I don't think it only hits one enemy necessarily. Like if there if there if there's two enemies that are close together, it can pro potentially hit two, but it's not really it's not gonna reliably hit multiple enemies, basically. I've also heard that apparently her skill can miss against one enemy. If that is the case, and is still the case when she gets released, would be very sad. I'm gonna approach this with the assumption that her skill isn't missing. I'm hoping that this was just someone being skill issue, but just know that it might be a possibility. So tune into the stream on day one, twitch.tv slash 77 so that we can test if that's actually a thing or not. But yeah, when she uses her skill, she'll deal damage. And after that, uh, she will heal a certain amount of HP and then lose a certain amount of HP over time. Uh, if you if you tap it, you basically just don't go through the enemies and you just do the damage part. And then finally, we have the um, alignment Alignment bullshit. Fontaine characters have an alignment, either Numa or Uja. I don't know if that's how you pronounce them. We'll see when it comes out, I guess. Where basically enemies can be weak to certain alignments and attacking them with those alignments will either disable them or let you skip one of their mechanics or change their attack patterns to be more tame. It's kind of like bringing a bow, a bow user against the Aeon Blight Drake or bringing Quicken against Simon. As far as the, uh, as the characters that have been leaked. Lynette is the only Uja characters, which means that at least for the duration of 4.0, she will be your only option if you want to deal with the mechanic with the Uja alignment. And basically what this does is when she uses her skill, she does additional animal damage. That is just a, a tiny little bit more that is aligned with Uja. All in all, right at talent level nine, her skill is a little bit over, like including the Uja hit. It's a little bit over 500 motion value. It's reasonable. The main potential issue with this is that the 12 second cooldowns are inherently very, they're awkward because there's just not that many teams that do 12 or 25 ish second rotation. There are some, right? If you look at a lot of the quicken teams, they can do rotations around that length in order to work around Fischl's skill cooldown basically. But a lot of characters want to work with either 20, 21 second rotations or like 15, 16 second rotations. So you're unlikely to get two elemental skills per burst, which can make her ER, or her ER requirements a little bit higher. She does generate four particles with her skill, so it's not like she has terrible energy generation, but the 12 second cooldown is a potential a potential downside. You will get the Uja damage when you use your skill. It's not damage over time, from what I understand, but there is a separate cooldown to the Uja thing that, that is, again, right, separate from the skill, which means that if you are to use her with Sacrificial Sword or Thundering Fury or, I don't know, Chung Yun plus Animal Resonance, and you get skills faster than the interval, which is 10 seconds, it will not do the Uja thing again. That's basically because there's some upcoming enemies or you need Uja to, to deal with their mechanics where maybe you get rewarded for having two characters that can deal with Uja because you would need to hit them twice to disable their mechanic. And if you only have one character, then you can't just use Sack and, and, and deal with it instantly. I'm guessing that's the idea behind this, but effectively, right, unless you're somehow managing to get her cooldown below 10 seconds with cooldown reduction effects, you will just get this every time you use your skill once. Honestly, 
this kind of worries me. I'm not a fan of the new Fuja Numa mechanic because I think it definitely could be used to shake up the meta in healthy ways, but gacha games aren't known for their fair business practices, let's just say. And so they might heavily push these new mechanics and make it basically impossible to play without them, which would make it an actual requirement to have characters that have them, not just to have, but to use. And then they can make pretty shit characters that can do it and then good five stars and give you the give you the shit four star and be like yeah we gave you something you are able to deal with this without swiping but look at this shiny character that isn't gonna make your team feel like shit it worries me because i don't really trust hoyo to care about the health and quality of their game over profits but if you want to be optimistic, like this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Anyways, let's take a look at the elemental burst. All right, so it's a 70 cost burst with 18 second cooldown. Lynette raises her mantle high, dealing AoE animal damage using a skillful sleight of hand to make a giant boggle cap box appear. Boggle cap box, taunts nearby opponents attracting their attacks. So it's a taunt. Taunts in this game don't tend to work all that well. That being said, a good part of that is because they don't last that long. But from what I understand, the main reason why taunts very often look or feel like they're not doing anything is because if an enemy has started an attack, they won't redirect in the middle of it if you summon a taunt. And sometimes enemies like quote unquote decide on what attack they're about to do and they start their animation even if they're not actually doing anything yet a lot before it looks like they are, which means that you'll use your taunt but the enemy has already decided that they're focused on you for the next attack. I don't really understand the specific mechanics of how taunts work, but that's based on my testing that seems to be my experience. That being said, if a taunt lasts four seconds, then like if the enemy attacks once and they have decided to do their attack before you summon the taunt, well, most likely by the time they do their next attack, your taunt is gone. 12 seconds is a very long time, which means that if it does actually work, which again, I'm not sure that it will, but if it does actually work, would actually be a fairly reasonable form of defensive utility. It won't be great, but it might actually be relevant. Another issue is that a lot of taunts actually are elemental skills rather than elemental bursts with sometimes long or uncancelable or clunky animations. I'm talking mainly about Mona and Amber here. Tilknetti's taunt is like, I mean, it's not really a taunt, but it, it does feel a bit nicer than them. Ganyu's taunt also feels a little bit nicer because the animations are faster. Yeah, and also a lot of taunts can be destroyed. This doesn't look like it has health or can be destroyed. So anyways, point being, if this taunt works like as reliably as like Ganyu taunt, for example, and it lasts 12 seconds, then that's actually reasonable. Like that's a nice little form of defensive utility. It deals damage to nearby opponents at intervals. And when the Boggle Cat box comes into contact with Hydro Pyro Cryo Electro, it will gain the corresponding elements and additionally fire vivid shots that will deal damage from that element at intervals. From what we know so far, this can't use pre-existing auras on enemy and will only get infused when you attack it or when enemies attack it, which will make doing some setups basically not actually doable, impossible, whatever. It will impact what kind of setups you'll be able to do basically. And also it apparently has the same infusion priority of, as animal main character, which is cryo first rather than pyro first with the rest of the order being the same. Cryo, pyro, hydro, and then electro. But realistically, it won't really matter because it's very unlikely that you actually hit the box with two different elements on the same frame. I was initially very excited about this because early on we we had some footage that didn't show the infusion that showed that her skill hits every second or her burst hits every second, the animal part. And I was like, oh wow, it hits every second and it has an infusion. And then she has a constellation, C2, that basically doubles the infusion damage. It makes it so that you fire two vivid shots instead of one, which is the infusion part. And I was like, wait, are they giving us a character like an animal character where it does so much infusion damage that you will want to build them like pyro damage or electro damage or power damage or whatever damage you infuse rather than animal damage that would be so cool as it turns out the vivid shots are a lot slower than the bubble cap box damage on intervals and they only hit every 2.3 seconds rather than every second so yeah that idea won't work. Overall, Lynette, Lynette's leaks have been a roller coaster of emotions to the point where I really don't know how to feel about her. I, I did take a look at some calcs for what her output looks like. Without constellations, she's 
fairly underwhelming. With Constellations, she's okay. But her having the Uja mechanic might make her the best animal unit to put on your teams if you need to have Uja against some enemies. And I feel like if they actually do make enemies that need Uja to hit, this could have been worse. Obviously, if the taunt actually feels like shit in practice, if the skill can indeed miss, and if it misses often, then this might be a Kohli situation where it looks really good on paper, but a lot of non kit related things make the character feel a lot worse than they should. I hope that's not the case, right? I hope that she also does feel decent-ish to use, just like her kit seems to be decent-ish. If that's the case, that's actually kind of a pleasant surprise. They could have made a Mika that was the only free-to-play, like, non-five-star Uja character. Like, they, they could have forced, you, forced us to use a character that just is not very good. And looking at this, this is actually reasonable. It'll fit in a bunch of teams because it's Animo, it has VV, and as we're gonna get into, she actually has a slight team buff as well. This could have been a lot worse for the, like, free-to-play Uja character that everyone's gonna be given for free, apparently. I heard that she was given for free. For a free character that may be necessary to deal with some boss's mechanics, this could have been a lot worse. This feels a lot more like a Kea than like an Amber or a Lisa, which is very good. Obviously, when you compare her to the other animal units, the ones that are like good, she's not gonna look great because not only is animal just good, but the quality of animal units that we have in Sucrose and Kazuha is through the roof. It's very hard to make a unit that outshines them in some situations without just making a broken ass unit. And I don't really, from this, right, I don't really expect her to be on the same level as Sucrose or Kazuha. Anyways, let's keep going with her passives. Within 10 seconds of using her, that's her burst, all party's attack members will be increased by a certain amount based on the elemental types in your party. If every character is the same elemental type, it'll be 8%, and then it's plus 4% for every additional elemental type. Uh, this is a lot like Yelan's passive, which... Honestly, I think a lot of people don't even know about. Elan's max HP is increased based on the amount of elemental types in your party. This is generally not significant enough to really justify putting different elements in your party just to get this buff. So it's just like a nice bonus if you happen to be playing her in a team where there's a lot of different elements. That being said, it is a buff to the whole party rather than only one member of the party. This is basically just a nice little upside to her being in your you party, uh, where it's it's definitely not going to be better than the EM you get from Sucrose or the damage percent you get from Kazuha, but it does alleviate the amount of damage that you lose from running her instead of them if you need to have Uja. Or if you just like her and want to play her because you think she looks cool. Second passive, after the Boggle Cat performs elemental conversion, her burst will deal 15% more damage. This is also not that huge of a deal. So let's actually take a look at what her damage profile is going to look like before we start getting into the like the usual pre-release stuff. So her elemental skill, right? The motion value is 455.6% plus 53%. Her elemental burst, initial hit is 141, 141.4. Then you can get up to, right? This is once per second, but I don't know if it's going to be like starting at second one or starting at second zero. I'm guessing it's starting at second one, but I don't know if it ends at 12 or if it ends at like 11.9. Basically, I don't know if you're going to have 11 or 12 hits of this. I'm guessing you're going to have 11, but it might be 12, but 11 times 87%. Now this, the Vivid Shop damage is going to depend on when you actually infuse, because again, right, apparently you can't infuse all of the elements already present on enemies or yourself. So it will be infused after it's summoned. In 12 seconds, you can theoretically get up to five at 2.3 seconds, but that requires infusing it basically immediately. I'm gonna assume you managed to do that, but just know that it's possible you only get four instead of five. Obviously, this is not actually all animal damage, right? This part is elemental burst, animal, elemental burst infusion. All right, so just from the elemental burst animal part, it's already twice the skill. So even if you somehow manage to get two skills per rotation, which some teams you might be able to do, but it won't be every team. Even if you do manage to do that, you're still getting more damage from your burst and from your skill. I don't actually know if her elemental burst can snapshot. I'll talk about both possibilities. So I guess we can start with if it doesn't. If it doesn't, I mean, it will make her damage go down a little bit. Uh, it would be fairly unfortunate because you don't really want to unfield her unless you actually go to C6 on her, which we'll talk about later on. If her burst doesn't snapshot, you get 
kind of whatever damage from it. It's it's all right, but it's nothing all that great. If it does snapshot, it does become a little bit better, which will help her damage, obviously. But yeah, let's let's talk about her constellations a little bit more. When enigmatic enigmatic faints, enigma thrust, which is when her, you use her E, hits an opponent, a vortex will be created at that opponent's position that will pull nearby opponents in. I don't believe this works on the press version because it specifically says hits an opponent with a shadow sign and the shadow sign is what you apply with the hold version of the e the e does not seem to actually have the shadow sign the top e i mean so this might not work on top e it might only work on hold e uh in any case we have a little bit of information on like the the size and strength of this it is a little weird though so apparently right it says the size of the circle with a radius of six meters same as sucrose e and ferrazon uh, which is actually fairly big the pull speed is significantly greater than Sucrose E and Ferrazon, same as Kazuha Hold E for lighter enemies, and same as Kazuha Press E for heavier enemies. So Sucrose and Ferrazon E don't actually pull enemies in. They don't have pull speed. They do have inward stagger, which can lead to inward knockback, but there's no suction in the thing. Actually, that's not that's not actually true. There's like a tiny little bit of suction, but my point is that Sucrose's skill pull speed is not representative of Sucrose's E's ability to group. So I don't know. I don't know if I would interpret this as her skill grouping enemies better than Sucrose E does, because it might only be suction. It might not have inward stagger. Yeah. So as you can see, right, this small suction that is Sucrose's E pull speed. It is very small. But when you use Sucrose's E, it still groups the enemies fairly well because it can stagger enemies, knock them up, knock them back. And it knocks them back towards the middle. It's the same reason why so many people don't like the grouping from Sucrose's Burst. Because, well, Sucrose's Burst has great pull speed, it also has outward stagger, which will potentially ungroup the enemies while it's trying to group them. Point being, basically, low pull speed doesn't necessarily mean bad grouping, and high pull speed doesn't necessarily mean good grouping. Right, if we look at Kazuha's Hold E, obviously you can see that it does have a lot better pull speed, but if the E itself doesn't hit the enemies, it does a lot less, right? Because you're not getting any part of the stagger. Anyway, my, my point with this is just, this does not necessarily mean that her grouping is better than Sucrose's and Ferrazon's. It might be, but not necessarily. And just keep that in mind. That being said though, even if it has no, basically no inward stagger, and even, fuck, even if it has a little bit of outward stagger from the skill itself, this should still be a fairly nice constellation to have. And if you end up replacing her, or replacing your Kazuhar Sucrose with her because you need to use Uja to deal with an enemy's mechanics, getting this will also alleviate how she might feel worse than them. C2, whenever the Boggle Cap box summoned by Magic Trick Astonishing Shift fires a Vivid Shot, it will fire an extra Vivid Shot. So that's the thing I talked about earlier. It basically doubles her infusion damage. However, another thing that she that this does, you might not notice at first, but if you if you were paying very close attention earlier, I talked about how often her elemental burst infusion hits, and I said 2.3 seconds. <clears throat> now, if you are a knowledgeable theory crafter, if you are someone who's been watching my videos for a while, or who's looked at theory crafting sources elsewhere, you might know, oh, that's less than 2.5 seconds. And 2.5 seconds is the general timer rule for internal cooldown reset. So let's do a quick little rundown of how ICD works. Basically, when I hit an enemy with an attack of a given element, it won't always apply the element. A very good way to notice this is go to the Regis Vine of your choice, pull out a character that has like a catalyst normal attacks or whatever, and go and hit their core. The first hit will reduce the shield, but then hit number two and three will not. If I wait between my hits, they will. And finally, if I hit four times in a row, one, two, three, one, four, one, two, three. yeah, okay. If you do four in a row, the fourth one will apply its element. And then if the reset from time, right, because we've seen that your internal cooldown can reset if you wait long enough, that like hit counter reset after three hits is separate from the timer reset, which means that if 2.5 seconds from your first hit happens right after your fourth hit, then you can basically start over and get one on your fifth hit. So you'll get on hit number one and then four and then right again after five by basically getting a double reset. Yeah. So if we just do normal attacks on Yanfei, one, 
what, four, four, five. And the, the core lost shield value on hits one, four, and five because of that reset. Now, what's gonna happen with Lynette at C1 is that you'll get your first hit at zero seconds. Hit one, zero seconds. And you'll get your second hit at 2.3 seconds. And it will not apply the element. Hit four or hit three will happen at 4.6 and it will. Hit four will happen less than 2.5 seconds after this, right? At 6.9. That's only 2.3 seconds because it's every 2.3 seconds, which means that this won't apply either. So you'll only apply your element every other proc of her Vivid Shot. At Constellation 2, instead of getting one hit, you get two. So you get hit one and two. And then here you get hit three and four, which means the fourth hit, well, it's happening before the timer reset. So you will also apply on the second wave, right? Wave one, wave two. And right after you get hit number four, the timer resets, which means on wave three, once you get hit number five, the hit number five will apply again. It'll be basically your hit number one for the next set of attacks. And what's gonna happen is effectively, hit number one is gonna apply the element and hit number four is gonna apply the element. And then hit number five and then hit number eight. That is assuming that all of the hits are hitting the same enemy, which, all right, we'll have to test that when she comes out. Uh, but theoretically, her constellation two could double the elemental application from her vivid shots. Is that elemental application all that big? Not really. So it might not matter even then, but there may be teams that I'm not thinking of because I'm a little corn,ge uh, where where that might actually be good. That might actually matter. Uh, C3 increases her burst damage. Again, her burst should be the bigger portion of her damage. Her C4 is actually quite helpful for like 20 second rotations where it's very difficult to fit two skills in a 20 second rotation because, well, you can't, it's 12 seconds. But it is reasonable to fit the equivalent of two skills per rotation if you have two charges because it would be difficult if you had one charge because you'd have to swap back to her exactly 12 seconds after and then it would delay your next rotation in weird ways. But if you can use both of them at once and then just not swap to her for 20 something seconds and then use her E a little bit later into your next rotation, it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of how and when you wanna use your skill, which should lead to the amount of skills per rotation going from basically one and no more to two on almost every rotation, one on some rotations. It is worth noting that much like Sacrificial Sword, this should not actually increase the amount of Uja aligned animal damage you're doing. You will only get the Uja line damage once if you use both of her skills at once. So if you're planning on, right, if you're using her skill to break an Uja mechanic, just keep in mind that with her C4, you don't get to, you know, do it twice in a row. You'll still have to wait the 10 seconds. C5, skill damage, it's all right. And then C6, it gives her an animal infusion when he, she uses her skill for six seconds, as well as animal damage bonus. One interesting thing to note is that infusions work similarly to characters and enemies in the sense that if you apply more than one element to a weapon, you can trigger a reaction. And it is possible to trigger swirl from this, which means that it could be used to get some swirls without having the cryo on the enemy, right? It could be used for double swirl setups with stuff like C6 Bennett or Chongyun, where basically you Bennett burst, you put Hydro on the enemy, you swap to Lynette, you use her E, it swirls Hydro, it applies Animo to her weapon, which was infused with Pyro from Bennett C6, it triggers Swirl on the weapon, it does a Pyro Swirl, which shreds Pyro resistance. So you've got, gotten your double Swirl. So this could be useful for some double Swirl setups. It's similar to uh, Kazuha's C6, but it's more relevant because I can see a world where there ends up being more people with her C6 than Kazuha's C6 in a few months. Is it worth going for her C6 just for that? Probably not. That being said, I don't know if you will have actually reliable double swirl setups without it. So if you end up forcing her in teams like National or whatever, if because you need Uja, you might have to give up on your double swirl and only swirl one of your two elements. In terms of its value, like of its traditional value of like the actual infusion, it's all right. For like driving things. I, I I don't see these motion values as being anything interesting. Maybe the charge attack animation is fast enough that something might happen, but I, I just, I don't really see it. To me, this is just a weapon swirl simulator, but hey, I hope I'm wrong. I hope there are ways to use her as an on-fielder with this. Uh, there's also the, obviously the 20% animal damage, which means that you'll be able to snapshot more animal damage on your burst if it does snapshot. But yeah, all in all, uh, looking at her output, she's like, okay, 
Like, if you stack buffs on her and you use her, like, as a quick swap unit, maybe you use her in, like, a Wanderer team where you're using Farazan already. If her taunt is enough defensive utility, in which case she would deal fairly reasonable damage. We'll have to see where exactly she ends up falling in the meta. But I would say that overall, I'm not, not, neither really optimistic or pessimistic about her. I kind of feel neutral, not in the, like, I don't care way, but more in the, like, I think she'll be all right way. Let's get into the good old pre-release weapon artifact all that good stuff sheet before i get into that let's just quickly introduce sack Vigil sword if you do use sack sword you can actually reach a point where her scale represents more damage than her burst especially if you have c4 so if you do obviously your damage profile is going to be slightly different but we'll address that when we get to it in order to really look at her weapons we have to look at her energy generation if you're playing her in a team as the sole like the, the, the only animal unit and you're using her in the same way that you'd use sucrose or kazuha as a vv unit uh your particle generation is obviously gonna depend a lot on which specific team you're playing so let's take a look at maybe just two of them for now a slightly lower energy generation team and a slightly higher one so for the slightly lower one let's look at like national with maybe two bennett funnels into sailing so uh with national you would only have her own particles and you would only have them once at a baseline different element she shouldn't really catch any of them you might try to do some setups with woba that would involve her catching a pyro particle so let's assume that one pyro particle caught then Guoba is gonna have its three particles not caught let's say two bennett funnels clear particles for now let's look at fab singto let's say oh yeah i forgot singto's particles so that would lead you to a total energy of about 26 baseline which would make your cost right your cost is 70 which would make your er requirements quite high however obviously this is a fairly low particle generation team if we take a look at a higher particle generation team like aggravate for example let's say we're looking at a yai aggravate team you can do 25 second rotations in aggravate teams which means you're probably getting two e's per rotation same element that's eight particles yai herself is generating one particle per three second and a 25 second rotation that's about eight maybe seven if you don't get like perfect up your, your uptime lining up perfectly then you have official particles which is at 24 seconds of oz that's 24 hits multiplied by 0.6 let's assume that it's not like perfect oz back to back and it's like 22 hits all right oh these are not caught by the way there are maybe some of them are caught let's say three of them are caught by her and then you have whatever dendro unit let's say we don't have a healer so let's do yao yao if you're doing yao yao that's another 4.5 then you have electro resonance which is about four on average let's say one of these is caught by her and the other three are not clear particles for now let's fucking assume that only yao yao is on fav so she shouldn't catch any of the enemy particles yao yao will get a proc and let's say only one proc for now anyways and this brings her ear requirements a lot lower and this is fairly conservative assumptions for the energy yao yao can very possibly get more than one fav proc we were slightly conservative in both official and yao energy generation in a 24 second rotation maybe two clear particle drops is a little bit lower than what you should expect point being as a unit with th that isn't really like that insane at any specific thing she's fairly versatile i guess you can kind of use her as the vv unit in any team where you'd want a vv unit the air requirements are going to differ a huge amount based on which team so just keep that in mind once we get to the weapon sections there is a huge disparity in terms of er requirements based on which team she's being used in finally let's take a look at what happens in wanderer team maybe where you're using her as the last slot right so wander let's do with fares on c6 and without without that's five from wanderer and two from Farazan. Uh, neither of them should really be caught by her different elements you basically just have bennett let's be a little generous and assume two bennett e's realistically Farazan is on fav the air requirements are fairly high in something like this to the point where you'd probably want to go fav on her as well which would obviously bring down your requirements a decent amount but still high enough that fab would be good uh, or sack sack would work too that being said if you have her c4 you can potentially get a double e in which case her your requirements go down a fairly good amount and obviously if you have pairs on c6 well instead of being two particles it's closer to like six anyways point being like even even in those teams where your requirements can differ a decent amount so 
when I'm describing the weapons, I'll talk about the non-ER weapons a bit more than I talk about the ER weapons, because for the ER weapons, it's just fairly straightforward, right? If you need a lot of ER, go for one of the ER weapons. In any case, let's get started on the weapons. For the five stars, Lo-Fi is basically just a stat stick. Haran is basically just a stat stick because she's not really gonna normal attack, unless you are at C6, in which case, I, 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 again, I, I'm not too optimistic on her normal attack combo at C6. Miss Flitter, it's gonna be decent. It's gonna be a stat stick, but that gives more stats than the others, basically. Jake Gutter is gonna be a good stat stick as well. Uh, Summit Shaper, fine stat stick again. Freedom Sworn can be good in some teams. It doesn't have any like particular synergy with her, but if your team cares about normal charge plunge attack, you, you have a Freedom Sworn lying around and you're not struggling with your ER requirements, this might be fine. I'm not really gonna, I'm not actually gonna include it though. Just know that it's an option if you have a Freedom Sword lying around, but it's it's not the main thing I'd recommend. Uh, Scoured Blade, I don't really like too much over the other ER weapons because getting that energy generation for the rest of your team is really nice in the teams where you do need ER from Favonius effect or something like that. But Scoured Blade is still reasonable if you don't have Fav or Sock. All right, so mainly it's like these four if you're focused on her damage. I would put these two above the other two, but there shouldn't be that huge of a difference between any of them. When it comes to four stars, if you don't have five and you need, want an ER weapon, the upcoming, it's an ER weapon that gives 32% ER after using your skill for five seconds. So it gives a lot of ER basically. It's kind of like a, a free to play cope alternative to Fav. It's not crazy, but it is a nice free to play option to have. Uh, Finale of the Deep is gonna be, assuming that the heal, the heal from her elemental skill happens after the Bond of Life is granted. If it does, then it will be a very strong free to play option. Now, when you're playing her in teams with Bennett, you might get a lot of attack which might make a weapon that just gives you a lot of attack a bit redundant. So if you have the upcoming new battle pass weapon, the Wolf Fang, which gives crit rate on skill and burst, and which makes hits of your skill and burst increase their own crit rate for each hit, basically. So if you have a like her elemental burst, which is multiple, multiple times, it basically gains crit rate over time, every time it hits. Uh, this should be fairly good on her as well. I wouldn't really go for any of the EM weapons. I, I guess I haven't talked about this, but her Uja hit does not actually apply Animo, right? It applies zero units, which means it won't swirl. Her E itself will swirl. And then her burst has standard ICD. It hits 12 times. So we would expect a total of four Animo applications from the burst and then one from each skill used, which is fairly low. And she actually does have some reasonable motion value multipliers. So I think in most teams, you will end up not really building her with EM and focus more on talent damage. That being said, if you already have one of them leveled and you don't want to level something else, it can't, it'll, it'll do the job. I don't really know that I would recommend Aminoma. You're not going to get enough skills in your rotation to actually take advantage of this properly. If you have her C4 and you actually do do two E's per rotation and you already have a high refine Aminoma from, I don't know, playing Ayaka or another character who wanted to use Aminoma, like you, you can use it. It's not going to be bad, but it's not what I would be going for, for sure. Again, right in the teams where you need high ER, I would generally go towards the ER weapons rather than the damage weapons. But yeah, you can also consider stuff like Blackcliff, but it, but I wouldn't really use Blackcliff over the new Craftable because it's not actually all that great un unless you start actually getting kills and she's an off-fielder who doesn't do that much damage. So it's very unlikely that she ends up being the one to get kill credit. So she's not going to gain any stacks. Yeah, that basically just leaves us with Lion's Roar, which is a fairly good option. But if you don't have Lion's Roar, be happy with Finale of the Deep. This weapon is very good. Assuming that you can prog this passive, and especially if you start refining it, this is a very strong free-to-play option on a lot of characters. Okay, so this would probably be the order for the non-ER weapons than for, for the actual ER weapons. I do Favj, Sacrificial. I probably would put Fav Sword above Sock Sword. However, there is definitely an argument to be made for Sock with her because her E does do a reasonable amount of damage. It'll depend on what team you're using with her. I think in teams where she's solo Animo, I don't really value the additional animal particles that much. If her E animation is like very, very fast, it might still be better. I'm not confident in which one of the two will be better, basically. They're both gonna work though. So that's basically it for weapons. So good stat stick, good stat stick, decent stat stick, decent 
stop, stick, good, stop, stick, good, free to play, stop, stick, pouch. Wow, I can E twice. Fine, non gotcha option. I mean, I guess I could include Lion's Roar. Decent four star stat stick. Lion's Roar should be fairly interchangeable with the new free to play option. It just works really well with her. Again, that is assuming that it does work. A uh, Festering Desire will also be a fine option, just like Fleuve Sound, but I would probably gravitate towards this a little bit more. Artifact sets. I don't think it will come at least for prize to anyone that if you end up playing her as your VV unit, you should put VV on her. If she is not the only animal unit on your team, if either you're playing mono animal, or like a Wanderer team with Farazhan, or you're playing a team that just has two animal units, what else can you consider? Depending on how or the, the HP consumption interacts with the new Marie Chaussée artifact set, this could potentially be her best set, but that's like assuming that this crit rate is snapshotable. I don't know if it will be. Crit rate has a very annoying tendency to sometimes be snapshotable and sometimes not. But even then, you would still have to use your E and then wait three seconds before you use your burst, which would remove the ability to pre-funnel. It might work in some rotations, but it won't work in every rotation. So I'll mention it as an option. Might be good. If you're playing her in teams where she has fairly high ER requirements, or piece emblem, good if high ER. Other than that, you can kind of just go two piece, two piece stuff. You could go for a piece noblesse, but I don't see that many teams where you'd play her where you wouldn't play someone like Bennett and put that unit on noblesse. Vermilion, Vermilion will force you to QE instead of EQ. I don't know how much I like that idea. Actually, no, yeah, Vermilion won't work because, right, you only start gaining stacks after using your burst, but you snapshot when you use your burst, so you'll never have any stacks. Maybe it'll let you snapshot the 8% initial attack percent, but you won't get any, any of the additional one of the four 10% attack stacks, so it, it won't be very good. Like at that point, you're better off running two piece, two piece. If it does not snapshot, it'll be decent. You still won't get it on your E, which is a fairly reasonable portion of your damage. So I don't know if it'll be better than the alternatives, but if it doesn't snapshot, this will actually be good on her. But yeah, other than that, it's mostly like four piece noblesse. Good if nobody else is using it. Other than that, it's probably just two piece, two piece. Uh, you can use Glava Walker if you're playing her in a Mono Pyro team. Blizzard Strayer, I guess, if you're playing her in Freeze. Thunder Soother if you're playing her in Aggravate or Taser. Blizzard Pavillon Conical if you're using her C6. I mean, sure. But again, right, I'm not too confident in her strength as an actual animal carry at C6. Wait, I think this is basically what it's gonna boil down to. Artifact, stats, here's the thing, all right? The reality is that Swirl is very, very good. So there will be situations where you might actually get more damage out of EM builds if you're not running like any external buffs and that sort of thing. But unlike characters like Kazuha and Sucrose, building her EM doesn't get you anything outside of just the Swirl damage, which means that you don't have an external incentive to build them EM other than the damage comparison. And when you're in single target, the EM build always loses. I would always recommend going attack damage crit on her, but I do want to make it clear that it won't be terrible to go full EM. If you don't have a set ready with attack damage crit, you can put her full EM in the meantime. And then a combination, fine transition. It also obviously will depend on your artifact quality, right? Better artifacts on crit builds tend to impact the strength of your build more than better artifacts on EM builds. Okay, and then finally we have the teams, which honestly, Honestly, I'm gonna leave blank because realistically you can use her in any team where you would use Kazuha or Sucrose and she will basically always be a downgrade but you will get Uja. So if you need Uja to deal with a mechanic, then you can use her there. Or I'll, I'll, I'll revisit a little bit what I said earlier. I am slightly worried that they end up using that mechanic as a way to make players feel forced to spend for characters. But if they don't, and if the mechanic is actually used to give a new dimension of design to characters so that they can make characters that are weaker overall, but do some cool things while being weak and who have a reason to be played sometimes through that Uja mechanic, like it could actually make the game feel more fresh and shake up the meta in healthy ways. I want to hope that they do it well. All right, like for example, if Deya was given that Uja mechanic, then you'd have a reason to use Deya. Even if she's not a very good character, you'd have a reason to use her in situations where in like every other case, Toma would be better or 
Shield Fae would be better. My point is basically, there are units that have really fun and interesting kits that are held back by the fact that they're just garbage. And having an incentive to play those garbage units with those fun kits, where it doesn't feel like you're nerfing yourself for fun, would be cool. So I hope that's the direction they end up taking and not just doing that and then releasing like two really strong characters that don't have any downsides, but also have the Uja or Numa mechanic. But there's no reason anymore to play the like weaker ones. Anyways, I'm 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 praying that they do it well. Let me know what you think in the comments about about what they're doing with this. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, YouTube.